I, I want to be sort of a bridge between, you know, all, all, all the cultures and, and, and make us realize, look, you know, we all have the same needs. You know, we may look different, but we all have the same needs. I felt that I experienced, you know, both the Iraqis plight and the, and the American soldiers plight. Uh, and, and, and I think at this point it's important to sort of try to understand what it's like for the, for the, uh, the American soldiers as well. This is not a justification, it's just a, like an explanation to why maybe they, they reacted the, the way they did. The reality for, for these guys is that they, they are, you know, they were sent supposedly to Iraq, supposedly to, to, uh, to get rid of, uh, you know, weapons of mass destruction. They found none. They went there to liberate the, the Iraqis and, and even the, the American soldiers, some of them that I spoke to said, Oh, you know, <laughs> what do you mean, liberate Iraq? You know, this is obvious, you know, we are just here to liberate uh, Iraq from its oil. And the only contact they get with Iraq is, is either when they arrest or, you know, attack Iraqi homes or the people that, you know, are sort of working, you know, cooperating with the, the Americans, you know, selling stuff or, you know, providing some kind of service. And I think if, if, if we sort of put that uh, in, in, into context, then, you know, maybe we can understand, at least to a certain extent, why some of these things happen. December 12th, uh, early in the morning, uh, I was with uh, one platoon from Charlie Company, and their objective was to arrest uh, two persons who were, two male uh, persons who were Guilt, uh, accused of, of financing the, uh, the insurgency in, uh, in Samara. And uh, we arrived at their house around 4, 4.30 in the morning. Um, and at first the soldiers tried to open, uh, open the gates and they, were not, they weren't able to. So they basically had one of the, you know, uh, APCs, armed person carriers, which is kind of like a, um, it's like a tank, except that it's, you know, it, it's uh, smaller and it, it carries personnel in the back. And they use one of those just to break through the, the gate. And uh, for, for the families, this must have been like hell broke loose. You know, all of a sudden they hear this tremendous roar. And then you know, the gate, just, you know, is, is taken down. Coming through. Coming through. And then you hear the soldiers, you know, running in, uh, kicking on the doors, yelling, you know, Open up, open up. Of course, in English, you know, nobody, uh, nobody spoke Arabic. Uh, eventually, this poor woman opens the door, and she's terrified. And, and uh, within seconds, some ten soldiers uh, have entered the house with their, their you know, their uh, M16s or whatnot. And this man he, is a suspect of a. Um, of financing the insurgency in Samara. And what we have to understand here is that all the family is terrified because they don't know what's going to happen. I mean, they've heard of cases where, you know, the fathers and brothers and husbands have been taken away and never returned. Uh, and, and also it's an outrage that, you know, foreigners, you know, non-Muslims break into a house like this uh, not respecting the women, not respecting the, the people living there. And we can even see how one of the soldiers touches one of the women. I mean, that's a taboo. You don't do that in, 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 in the Muslim culture. And here we see how uh, they put hoods on, on the heads of the suspects. And this is a common practice, and the hood is made of a plastic. It's used for, as sand, for sandbags. I, I, of course, I, I asked the soldiers, you know, why? And they said, well, it's because if they wear hoods, you know, they're like blind, uh, you know, 
chickens. I mean, they can they can run without if they can't you know if they can't see, they're not able to run away from us. Here we can see how the uh, soldiers go into the house and looking for evidence. Uh, they go through documents trying to identify the people, and we must remember that most of these documents are in Arabic, and uh, the soldiers do not speak or, or read Arabic. So how they can identify, identify the suspects uh, is to me a mystery. Well, you know, it's the, the name, you know, looking at documents, well, the, and, uh, you know, identity cards and whatnot. They say, well, the name is not exactly the name that we're looking for, but, uh, you know, we might as well just arrest this guy. And, and uh, you know, this is, uh, it doesn't really matter. You know, we, we go to a house and we don't find the particular bad guy we're looking for. Well, then we can, you know, we can pick up a, uh, arrest a, you know, a brother or, or, a, or a son or a father. Just calculating. Let's say that there are a thousand uh, raids per day in, in Iraq. And I, I think there are way more than that. And let's say that, you know, they arrest five people or they arrest one people, but, you know, the whole family, the whole neighborhood, you know, witness what happens. What's going to happen is that each raid probably creates, you know, 50 enemies of, of, of the Americans and of the occupation. And it's been going on for over a year now and it's, it's still going on. I, I, you know, you do the numbers and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's horrible, you know, you see no way out except that, you know, more and more people are becoming more, you know, more and more angry and, you know, will probably take, you know, take part in, in, the, in the resistance. And as we can see, it's been a, f a couple of hours now in between the initial shot and, and this shot, because we can see uh, how it's sort of getting uh, you know, lighter and lighter. This was a major operation. The whole Charlie company went out on, on raids all over uh, Samara. It wasn't just, you know, one company. There were many, many companies participating in this sort of offensive. And they all came back and, and uh, uh, you know, converged in, in this uh, base. The detainees were not given anything to eat or drink during all this time. And uh, we have to understand that it's extremely cold in Samara. Me being a Swede, I'm, I'm shivering from the cold. And here we can see how the soldiers are, are sort of celebrating their great victory. They are almost like big game hunters returning from a safari, showing off the trophies, you know, sort of bragging, uh, congratulating each other. Here you can even see how they take pictures of the trophies, something that I, I hadn't seen before. It was a very eerie experience. Again, you know, they, they are identifying going, the suspects going through their uh, documents, and here they're getting medical treatment. As you can see, these guys have bloody noses. There were four or five of those, and I assume that they have been, you know, manhandled. So how, how many people did you get tonight, do you know? 16. 16. Seven of them are from one house. Wow. I was thinking we'd find more weapons in them. I mean, this is the first time we go to houses in Samara. I figured we'd see more weapons in this. Because this is the, we only found weapons in one house. Okay. And usually, like, in, they're not in the house in uh, Saki either. But where they put them at is they're out in the orchard. But you go down town Samara, there's no orchard. So they have them in the house. They have, like, their little front yard. They could bury them. But you know, it's not that hard to do the search and be done. But they don't really have anywhere to hide them. So I figured I thought we'd come up with more weapons in this. But... And the, the, the sad thing for these guys is we probably wouldn't let them go because their names don't match up. Why y'all messing with that man, dude? That's fucked up. You know, this, this man, he must have been in, in his 50s. And in the Muslim culture, you know, young people have to show respect to elderly people. Hey, is he ticklish? Yes, he do. Don't tell me.
You know, this poor man on the stretcher, that first of all, I, you know, he, he was drunk, so I'm, I'm sure that sort of, uh, you know, made him sort of, maybe in a sense that helped him, you know. I, I, I would hate to be conscient in, in, a, in, a, in a case like this, but I, I remember I looked at, I, you know, the, the hood didn't cover all his face, it left sort of, um, you know, his, his uh, chin and his jaw sort of bare, and I could see how his jaw was sort of, uh, what's the word, it was sort of almost shivering. And I, and, and, and I don't know, to me it almost looked like suppressed anger, so, you know, or, or, you know, a person is furious who cannot do anything. When the medic is, is doing his medical examination of, of this man, that he's not treating him in a, in a way that I expect him to treat a, you know, a regular, like, let's say, American patient. You know, he's not respecting that, as you can see here, that he's uh, in agony and, and, you know, he's trying to communicate to the medic, I, look, this hurts, and, and the paramedic just sort of slaps his hand like, like he were a child or something, and, and this is so sad to see how the Americans did not even try to communicate. They would yell at them, they would push them around, but they would not try to listen. I, I think that we all can see what the, the poor man is communicating, but the soldiers are soldiers and they don't want to uh, understand. Pay attention to this shot, because here we can see how the, the soldier touches the poor man's penis. And uh, this process of, of humiliation just gets worse and worse. And there he is lying on, on a stretcher, not able to do anything. Being exposed to this you know, is really demeaning and humiliating uh, treatment. I saw, I saw at least five or six guys, you know, touching this poor man's penis in terms of, of uh, you know, laughing, in terms of joking. I would say that the, you know, the majority were, they were part of, of this sort of uh, bashing party, whatever we would call it. Uh, that was, it was definitely not just a few bad, rot rotten apples. And the commanding officer did nothing. And, 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 and that to me is, 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 is shocking, you know. It, I, can, I think I can understand to a certain extent that, you know, young boys, they get carried away. But, you know, for, for, for a commanding officer to, you know, not stop this, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's outrageous. I would say that this was the culmination of, of, of what I experienced. I experienced how uh, the detainees were, you know, badly treated, you know, yelled at, uh, pushed around, uh, hooded, etc., etc. But I, I never saw uh, any kind of, you know, sexual abuse like, like I did in, in, in Samara. So, you know, all this uh, footage that, that has now been shown was taken in, in December. And, uh, and I guess to a certain extent, I didn't realize how sign significant this was. I mean, I knew it was significant. I knew that this is, you know, something that really depicts what, what is going on. But, uh, and I tried to, you know, I tried to contact, you know, mainstream media, in me first of all, Swedish media, and um, there was no response. And I tried American media, same thing, no response. It's, it's obvious that the newspapers, or sorry, that mainstream media uh, exercise some kind of self-censorship in which, you know, people know that, oh, this is a hot potato, don't, don't touch it because you're going to get burnt. And, and I think that, you know, as a journalist, you know, if if you if you're afraid of getting you know getting burnt you know you should uh, you should really look for another job. As a matter of fact, I was uh, interviewed by by a local TV station on on Friday, and they they asked you know why, why did you know they basically claimed that 
you know, Michael Moore should have given this footage to, um, you know, to the authorities. And I said, why do you blame uh, Michael Moore for something that you should be blamed for? You know, I contacted you guys when I was in, 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 in the States, you know, which is like th two months before, you know, the Abu Ghraib thing, uh, or three, mo three months before the Abu Ghraib thing broke. And, you, you know, you're not interested. And, and this, I think, is, you know, it's, it's, it's an outrage that people call themselves journalists, that newspapers have the audacity to call themselves newspapers, that, you know, TV stations uh, that have, uh, you know, news uh, shows have the audacity to call them, to, to even remotely, you know, link themselves to news, because as a, as a journalist, you know, you should have jumped on this. And uh, this is, you know, what people like Michael Moore does. You know, he is doing their job. Do you think, I mean, what you saw was exceptional? Like, this is the only footage of this kind of, you know, in the outdoor right. abuse yeah. kinds of scene. Yeah. Is it, was it very unique? No, sad, sad to say, I don't think that, I don't think that my footage is unique. What's unique is the fact that it's been, uh, you know, made public. You know, the, the mainstream media are accomplices as much uh, of, of, of this abuse as, as um, you know, individual soldiers, because I think that they have, they must have seen it. I mean, this is, you know, this is, this is not a, a some kind of random, uh, uh, act, you know, this is this is a policy. This is something that's ongoing. I've spoke. I mean, I've spoken to to many Iraqis, and it's like, duh. Of course, this is going on. Of course, this is going on. It's it's preposterous to even even think that there is any way you can you can win, you know, somebody's hearts and mind by by by, uh, you know, in, imposing such a, uh, a criminal and and. Uh, and horrible uh, policy, and and I know, I know Iraqis. Iraqis are an incredibly proud people. They're not they're not going to accept this. They're not going to accept this.